there are wars of words, as well as the very real war on the ground in Ukraine. President Biden surprised some in the West by using the term genocide to describe the Russian invasion. He clarified that it wasn't a legal term, just an observation. We've also been hearing uh, terms such as war crimes. In fact, the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, looking at mass graves in Bucha, said the whole country was a crime scene. Well, as we went on air, I spoke to Dr. James Gow, the co-director of the War Crimes Research Group at King's College London. I asked him whether Russia's actions in Ukraine constitute genocide. I think, Charles, that genocide is a very sensitive and difficult term. We've seen many cases where genocide has been alleged, but proving genocide becomes a great challenge if you're talking about it in terms of courts. The courts take very conservative interpretations of the Genocide Convention, and the things that people observe and call genocide are very often not things which will be proved as genocide in court. In this context, I think that Biden's uh, use of the term genocide follows that of many others in saying here is something really, really serious. We have another concept, crimes against humanity. And these are clearly crimes against humanity. That's the concept used at Nuremberg for the Nazis, from which the crime of genocide was eventually able to emerge. The problem with the term genocide is that it has a narrow definition. It's the intent to destroy a named protected group in whole or in part. And the problem that you're going to face before anything else in the case of Ukraine uh, is that simply the vast majority of those, I would suppose, who have been killed in many of the places we've seen on our news screens, uh, including Mariupol, are actually Russian speakers. They're being killed by Russians, and it would be very challenging in a court to bring that as a genocide case. So what we're talking about really is the widespread and systematic uh, practice of murder, rape, abuse uh, of various kinds. But to prove it as genocide is going to be a very technically difficult question. Well, that, that's an absolutely fascinating analysis that you've given there. And, and that spurs me on to sort of ask you, um, what's the legal definition of genocide? I know you touched on that briefly, but is there a difference between the legal definition and perhaps a more political or emotive use of the term genocide? Charles, I think you're entirely right on that. It's politically charged, emotionally, it carries a lot of weight. Uh, personally, I remain baffled that the events that gave rise to the Yugoslavia Tribunal, with which I was involved for a long time, uh, that were labelled genocide by observers and commentators, by the UN War Crimes Commission, uh, did not result in a single conviction for genocide for the events in 1992 that gave rise to all of that. So we see a clear difference between the use of the term politically to convey a sense of serious crimes being committed on a very widespread and systematic basis, and those technical issues that come when it's a matter of going to court. The, so, the, the definition I gave to, to destroy in whole or in part seems simple. You would think if you can prove intent, uh, leaving aside the protected group, that would be it. But that's not come to be the case. In the practice of the courts, they require other things. Like it's, they, they've used a, a test of substantiality, a threshold that needs to be passed. And on a simple analysis, we can run that on the experience so far that 5,000 at Srebrenica is an act of genocide, but maybe 2,000 at Priador is not. And that's a very, very difficult and challenging situation going by numbers and saying that the only way to prove intent is when you've got numbers of such a scale that we leave no doubt whatsoever about what that intent was. Very problematic area. 
Well, thank you very much indeed for clearing that up for us. And uh, just moving on, the International Criminal Court's chief prosecutor said today that all of Ukraine may well be a crime scene. What's your reaction to that? I think that's entirely right. Karim Khan, uh, of course, has the experience and he knows what he's doing and what his people will need to do. But we have to be clear that we have localized specific crime scenes, but when we're in a situation of this sort, where we're looking at crimes committed within the context of armed conflict, uh, then the whole of the country involved is potentially a source of information. There will be stronger, more localized, specific places in which material will need to be gathered, but that does not mean that the whole of the country can be excluded as providing evidence, uh, potentially providing evidence, that will be of use to the prosecutor and of probative value in a court. Dr. James Gao, I want to thank you very much indeed for your analysis there. And uh, Dr. Gao is the co-director of the War Crimes Research Group at King's College, London.